known as the Hornet's Nest, and one gang rules here. The Hidden Valley Kings have taken over Charlotte streets by any means necessary. Yo, protect the turf. You come wrong, you don't get your head knocked off. Power, money, greed, these things begin to take over. They've been pushed to the brink of extinction. The Hidden Valley Kings had the potential to be some of the largest money makers in the city of Charlotte. But you can't ever really kill a king. Kings ain't dead, we still kings, you hear me? And we still out here, they ain't stopping. They ain't gonna never stop that. Snitches get stitches all day. They do get dealt with. North Carolina, nicknamed the Queen City. Headquarters to some of the nation's largest banks, fastest tracks, and old money. This traditional southern city has doubled in size in the last two decades. The city has paid for its growth. Charlotte has a crime rate that's twice the national average and the gang culture to match it. Back to the hood. Back to the hood. You know, we the streets all day. There are over 150 gangs in Charlotte, separate gangs. Some of them are homegrown, some of them are national gangs. We're getting mad. I'm telling you, just come around here talking that and see what you catch. This gang problem in Charlotte is just growing. From the A side level D, he in the battle with the A side level D, he in the battle with the A side level D. The most notorious hometown gang in Charlotte can be found northeast of the city in a neighborhood called Hidden Valley. This is the dirty south, North Carolina, for real. The area has fairy tale street names like Cinderella Road and Snow White Lane. It looks like an ideal place to live. But laying claim to this kingdom is a street gang with a business model all its own. In Charlotte, the notorious Hidden Valley Kings rule. Every man is his own king, you know what I'm saying? A king is royalty. That's what the king is, supreme rule royalty. That's top dog. Anybody with him. Yeah, Valley Kings. One neighborhood is responsible for putting Charlotte on the map as having one of the most notorious gangs in our city, Hidden Valley, the hood I'm from. Ha, damn, who would have thought that? Damien Hill, AKA D Block, joined the Hidden Valley Kings when he was in high school. He quickly became a well-armed teenage drug dealer. There have been times where I go to school with my dope, with my pistol, have my pistol in my pocket, in the pocket of my folder, put it in my locker. When I leave school, the only thing I gotta do is hit the block. I ain't gotta go check in with grandma. Grandma ain't gonna tell me to watch dishes today. I'm going straight to the block. The cash he made dealing changed his life. And so weekly, we bring in like, as, as high school kid, we bring in 35, $4,500 a week. That's a lot of money. But that money changed people. You know what I'm saying? They felt like they had the power. But they felt like they had the respect. You couldn't tell them nothing. In Charlotte, the Hidden Valley Kings control the sales of cocaine, crack, marijuana, and ecstasy. I'm going to tell y'all how we done put pure cocaine product. 141 grams, listen to me. 155 grams, listen to me. That's over a quarter brick. The gang uses brutal force to stay on top. They've controlled it through acts of fear, violence, intimidation. Anybody can get it. That's a team game right here. 
This here Dallas. That's how we be doing this all. The Hidden Valley Kings had a multitude of guns, I guess you would say. The one that they usually had was generally 9mm, 380, 40 cal. They seemed to be impressed with trying to carry the same gun as the police department. That's how we do it. I done seen guns so big, I didn't even know they was guns. I'm like, what, what the hell is that? They a 50 cal machine gun. It looked like the one you get off the top of a hump. I'm like in the army with the chain bullets. The HVKs have another advantage in protecting their drug empire. The hood's unique layout makes it easy to spot outsiders. The reputation of the gang is, if you're not from Hidden Valley, you don't go to Hidden Valley. Other gangs don't venture into Hidden Valley. We're gonna hold this down, and we ain't gonna let nobody try to come in here and take this. We just gonna hold this down. Them bullets burn. People knowing that that much dope was coming up out of there, they gonna try to come in and take that. So with that, you come in trying to take it, it's gunplay. The maze of dead-end streets presents a problem for police. There's very few entrances. The way it's laid out, all the roads are curvy, it's hilly, it's very hard to do surveillance, and it's also easy for them to see you coming and to disappear before you ever get there. Police be wondering, trying to find out, you know what I'm saying, what we doing, where we going to. We dipping on them at all times. They don't know the streets like we do, you know what I'm saying? Straight like that. You can jump this fence and be in a whole nother area, other valley. It also gives former gang members who have grown up in the valley, like Sharon Barnett, an advantage when being chased. You knew the valley well, then your movement in the valley was was just swift. I mean, you knew that I can jump behind this fence and I can be in a whole nother section of the valley opposed if you're an officer, then you in a car, you gotta drive around. There are officers who have worked there for years that couldn't tell you the next street over when they get in a foot chase. This ability to escape has made the Hidden Valley Kings feel invincible. For years, their turf was so secure that they didn't mark it. They've had such a stranglehold on the community for so long, they don't need it. Their reputation speaks for itself. You don't need to tag up HVK on a wall when everybody knows you own it anyway. HV all day. But as the Hidden Valley Kings would soon find out, even the strongest empires are vulnerable. One ruthless shooting would threaten to bring the entire gang down. May 22nd, 2005. It was a busy night at Rack Runners, a bar and pool hall. Once you come in, if you ain't from the hood, I mean, automatically, you're going to feel like an outsider. They're going to make you feel like an outsider. It wasn't nothing but Hidden Valley Kings that represented that little pool hall. This security footage shows plenty of HVKs in the house. Among them, 20-year-old Jermaine Massey, a.k.a. J-Rock. Twenty-five-year-old Samuel Brown wasn't a known gangster, but Massey immediately picked him out. When Massey walked into the bar, they stared at each other for a little bit, and Massey made the comment, I'm going to kill somebody tonight. Just 15 minutes before closing time, a scuffle broke out when Sam Brown put a cigarette out in someone's drink. Brown then pulled a gun out of his waistband, and fired shots into the ground. J-Rock pulled out his own gun in response. At certain points of the video, you can see where uh, our victim is on the ground. He's already been shot, but that he does raise a handgun and fire in the general direction where we believe Massey was running at the time. Not long after that, you see basically a mad scramble inside the bar. Patrons running to get outside the establishment. You see Massey going towards the exit of the door. He actually reaches back, and you can see him in the video with a gun in his hand. J-Rock fired again before fleeing. 
Sam Brown died on the barroom floor. The thought that somebody would lose their life off of putting a cigarette out in somebody's drink, I think, talks to the mentality of the whole Hidden Valley King gang. The violence didn't stop there. The brazen killing set off a chain reaction. During the next few weeks, a series of high-profile murders would put the spotlight on the HVKs like never before. And Charlotte police would be forced into taking the gang down. They should have slowed down when the police stopped you. I mean, the feds on me. They would have made all the money they wanted to. If they hadn't have been violent, we'd have never known it. Charlotte, North Carolina. This traditional southern city is often voted among the best places in America to live. But looks can be deceiving. Some 100 gangs call this home. None more powerful than the one tucked away in a residential neighborhood. They are the Hidden Valley Kings, and they'll kill anyone at any time. The Hidden Valley Kings have a history of violence that dates back several years. The uh, crimes they've committed range from petty larceny to murder. Hidden Valley is a large suburban development of over 4,000 modest homes just northeast of downtown. It got its start in 1959. It was created really as a, a nice middle-class dream community where kids can play and be safe. Hidden Valley was designed without through streets and with only a few routes in, keeping traffic to a minimum and the hood kid-friendly. By 1970, the neighborhood was home to a mix of middle-class families, an example of how integration could succeed in the South. It was awesome, real close-knit community. We took pride in our community. We said, take a village to raise a child. And that was kind of my experience. The Valley helped raise us. Sharon Barnett moved here in 1976 with his parents and grandmother when he was six. They lived in this house on White Plains Road. There used to be a little tin shed back there. And that's where we used to do our thing and you know, whatever we had. We hung out in our area, we hung out in our section. If you wasn't in Hidden Valley, if you didn't live in that area, then you didn't come around there. Damian Hill moved to the valley when he was just three. I didn't venture to any other parts of town because, I mean, we had all we needed in the neighborhood. But in the 1970s, the city of Charlotte introduced public housing into the area, and Hidden Valley began to change. There was a lot of people that moved in. They really wasn't from the hood or whatever, but you know, they moved in, they adopted the hood, the hood adopted them, and they kind of like stirred it up to change the game. When the subsidized renters moved in, most middle-class families moved out. By the 1980s, neighborhood gangs began to form. Sharon joined his first gang when he was 18. My nickname was Red. My color of my hair was red coming up. I was a little cat on the block with the red afro, so everybody called me Red. The early gangs were a far cry from today's HVKs. Back then, it was just about going to the club and getting girls. You know, who was the freshest, who was the flyer, who could freestyle the best, who could break dance the best. To Red and his buddies, being fly meant smoking weed. Until 1989, when crack cocaine hit the valley, and with it, a different kind of joint. They call them wolves. You crush up the weed and you smoke it with the, the cocaine. But when cocaine hit, I'll say, we had little knowledge on the effect of it. Red quickly got hooked and was soon dealing. A dangerous business. At one point, Red needed to repay his dealer, but had spent the money getting high. It almost got him killed. I left home at 17. I began to kind of run for my life because I thought this cat was going to kill me because I owed the money. 
And street law says he had every right to. You do wrong, you mess up, you have to pay the piper. Red managed to keep a low profile until he paid off his debt. The lesson was clear. Crack cocaine had changed everything in Hidden Valley. When crack cocaine came in in the community, this is when it went crazy. Power, money, greed, these things begin to take over. The dealers took over the neighborhood and the community began to fall apart. One side of the neighborhood, we had this main drug dealer who provided us, who we looked out for. Another side of the neighborhood, we had another big time drug dealer. So basically that's where like a lot of feuding came in at. The trouble intensified when a former Chicago vice lord moved into an apartment complex in Hidden Valley. The vice lords had no interest in expanding to Charlotte. So the gangster founded the Kings, or crucial Islamic Nubian gods. The gang quickly found willing recruits in Hidden Valley, including Damien. So we just throwing up your K for the Kings or whatever. Now people throw up HV, you know, that's Hidden Valley, HV, you know, so it's done took his little steps. What started as a small group of about 10 members spread throughout the neighborhood. By 1999, the gang became known as the Hidden Valley Kings, the HVKs. We just took our own little thing, branched off, filtered off, and, and made our own little, like you said, little homegrown little, little gang. So we basically labeled ourselves as kings. Coming from the Queen City, we labeled ourselves as kings, kings of our city. They quickly began to take over the neighborhood, turning family and friends into gangsters. Blast asked to have his identity concealed. His brother was one of the gang's recruits. I grew up in this hood all my life. This is my hood, and I still protect my hood. I love my hood. And you know, I'm always in my hood, because this is where I was raised. Those who weren't part of the family were viewed with suspicion, or worse. The Hidden Valley Kings knew everyone in Hidden Valley. If you weren't from Hidden Valley, you weren't trusted. They were protected by turf. If you come correct, ain't what happened to you, but if you come wrong, you don't get your head knocked off. We just basically infiltrated on, on the people who tried to come and infiltrate on us. We just retaliated. We didn't really go out trying to look for, for trouble. You know what I'm saying? We stayed in our neighborhood. Dealers who wanted to sell dope in Hidden Valley paid a fee, or else. The Hidden Valley Kings had a stranglehold on the drug market in Hidden Valley. Younger gang members had to pay taxes to the older gang members. Independent drug dealers could sell in Hidden Valley, but they had to pay their block tax. And if they didn't pay, they were dealt with. If they don't want to pay their taxes, they're robbed, home invaded, beaten up, shot. Good through. The HVKs quickly built up a fearsome arsenal, buying powerful automatic weapons on the street. And we were riding around 18, 11, 12, like that. It was crazy. We had choppers. That's still that assault rifle, AK-47. Chopping, that's exactly what it would do. Chop, you. Yeah. I had a nine millimeter with a clip. Boy, it was a 38. And by the mid 90s, it began to be just a war zone. Gangs, violence, guns, prostitution, territory. The Hidden Valley Kings grew into a secretive membership of 500. The gang was literally able to get away with murder because the Charlotte PD was treating each of their crimes as an isolated incident. It simply didn't register that the city had a gang problem. As far as a department or a citywide thing, gangs weren't mentioned. It's like a taboo at that time. The police department and the city was just slow to, I think, recognize it or address it because nobody wants to say you have a gang problem. When the police arrested an HBK member, he was replaced on the street with a younger gangster. One of those leaders was a fierce teenager, Paco Greer.
only 19 years old, he was a born leader. He was real. You know what I'm saying? He did his thing. That's what it is. Yeah, it comes with respect and power. See, okay, this dude right here can do his thing. They gonna respect him. They called him Smith and Weston because he always kept two 357s. Just like that, Smith and Weston. Paco and the Kings had their neighborhood on lockdown. But when they left Hidden Valley, it was a different story. He didn't go out looking for trouble, but it was just a lot of hate that came with him being who he was. August 17th, 2001. Paco and a fellow HVK entered the Fancy Cat Club on the corner of Sugar Creek and North Tryon Streets. It didn't take long for a fight to break out with a rival gang. They got an altercation. He was looking out for one of his boys, I guess. And, uh, you know, Paco don't take no Paco and his buddy were thrown out of the club. That's when the real battle began. Shortly after the club's letting out, a gunfight ensues, which turns into a running gun battle through the parking lot. And Paco is hit. The shot pierced his back and abdomen. He died later at a nearby hospital. The killing was ruthless and blatant, but it still wasn't enough to put the Hidden Valley Kings on the police's radar. Born and bred in the Hidden Valley, born and bred all day. At the time this all occurred, nobody knew that Paco was a member of the Hidden Valley Kings because we really didn't have a formal gang operation within the department. We were late getting into the game. It would be 2003 by the time Charlotte police got serious about the HVKs. And by then, the violence wouldn't be just a Hidden Valley problem. Now, all of Charlotte was in danger. They were involved in shootings right in the middle of the afternoon and they didn't care. They wanted people to be afraid of them. Charlotte, North Carolina is home to the Hidden Valley Kings, or HVKs, the South's most ruthless gang. Yeah, we shoot. It's shooting going on. The HVKs govern their turf with brutal force. If you come over here and you got the mind for you, I'm going to go over here and f some of these. Then you keep women, then you keep women, then I pop your ass. Me and my homie just sitting right there on the post, just chilling. Next thing I know, somebody's spinning the cone of dumping. It ain't nothing nice. See bullets going, somebody flesh. See them bleeding. It's all about protecting their lucrative drug trade. Everybody got drugs. You're going to get drugs from anywhere. You know, they got all kind of crazy drugs. The weed, the marijuana, you know, the basic cocaine product. The gang avoids detection by only selling to known buyers. You have to have somebody who knows them to be able to buy from them. You can't just go up to the house and say, I'd like a crack rock. To manage their drug empire, the gang has divided their sprawling neighborhood into zones. I'm HV all day. Three zones. Remember that. Each zone is assigned to a crew that is authorized to run the business in that part of the hood. In that's the eighth the zone three, the battle again. The older members actually ran the zones. They were in charge of each zone. The gang likes to mock the Charlotte PD by adopting their ways, using the same guns and police terms. The police use the zones. So, you know, we just mock the police. This is the police zone, but at the same time, this is my zone. This is where I sell dope at. This zone two right here. Zone two right here. Zone two. The Hidden Valley Kings fly the colors green and black, adopted from a neighborhood school. Our school colors were green, you know what I'm saying? And from that point on, you know, like the, like, you know, Bloods got their red, Crips got their blues or whatever. We had our greens. The color green also shows up in the HBK's ink. There are king tattoos, and it's usually the crown with an HVK or an HV or something of that nature on it. A lot of them are very proud of being from the Queen City. There are a lot of Charlotte-type tattoos. They might got a king tattoo. You know, they might got an HVK or got them uh, 
The HP ain't nothing, that's just for the neighborhood. That's just you been around the neighborhood, you just gonna pray for your heart. I did that myself with a straight razor. Ooh. Massive blood loss. Ooh. That's north for life. I'm in these streets. I am the streets. Some kings have tattoos of a tree that marks the entrance to their neighborhood. We still in here, Valley. This right here is our tree right here, you heard? Our tree for the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Some of them will have a dead tree on it. To me, that's the vision that Hidden Valley's died. That kind of tells me they know what they've done to it. For many HVKs, ink is unnecessary. A lot of them don't have tattoos. Some of the younger guys don't have tattoos. They prefer to represent in a different way, wearing dreadlocks. The lock says something. It says, let me be me. It says, take me out the box. It says, you can't buy me, me no more because I'm going to be who I am. So let my hair just be wild. Get on my thug, a true humble united together and soul. They also use a strict system of rankings and titles to maintain order. The highest ranked members are called OKs. OK, which is the original king, was a title given to the original nine or ten members. The OGs, our original gangster, are right below the OK and are generally in a power position. Under the OGs are the BGs, the baby gangsters. In the Hidden Valley Kings, the BGs are foot soldiers who do most of the dealing and some of the shooting. Next are the Peewees, young gangsters in training viewed as little brothers. You got your little Peewees that you're gonna say what's up to you, my boss, ice cream man, now and then. Just chill with them, show them a little love. The Peewees are easy recruits. A lot of the younger guys joined the gang uh, because of they wanted protection, recognition, where they just looked up to these guys. They grew up in the valley watching these guys sell drugs and they thought it was cool. Most of the younger kids, they look up to them. They see their cars, their money. While the OGs make gang decisions, the foot soldiers deal in the zones and make their own drug money. It's not, you know, this guy's in control of these five people and this guy's in control of the, it's not the way it is. They're all just like a pack of wolves. They're all gonna go eat at the same time. The gang has one goal, keep the cash flowing into the neighborhood. We ain't gonna let nobody come over here and try to take something from the hood. And if it is some money in the hood, we gonna keep it in the hood. It's our neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? And we gonna test you. We gonna try our best to run you off. In 2001, the only original king left in the gang was a violent and powerful leader, Roscoe Abel. After Paco Greer was killed in a shootout, 22-year-old Roscoe took over. Roscoe Abel was one of the founding members of the Hidden Valley Kings. He was one of the older guys, and a lot of the younger guys looked up to him as a leader. When Roscoe took power, the HBKs were still riding high, confident the police had no idea how extensive their operations were. You don't hear these guys call themselves Hidden Valley Kings. It's not like they walk up to the police and go, yeah, I'm a king. At that point in time, we honestly viewed them as like street punks. We were all kind of new at the whole gang game, you know. Roscoe would take the Hidden Valley Kings to the next level and outside of their secure neighborhood turf. If they hadn't have been shooting, they would have made all the money they wanted to. Charlotte, North Carolina, 2003. The Hidden Valley Kings, the city's largest homegrown gang, had a new leader, an original king named Roscoe Abel. Roscoe Abel wasn't even on my radar to start with. He wasn't committing the petty crimes that most of the younger guys were. He stayed out of police sight. Under Roscoe's direction, the gang that once stuck to a lucrative drug trade on its home turf began getting into violent altercations with other dealers. 
The clashes raise the HBK's profile across the city. After years of denying the problem, Charlotte police finally began to address the rising level of gang violence. In 2003, they set up the city's first ever gang task force. The force began its work just as the Hidden Valley Kings exploded into view. They were involved in shootings right in the middle of the afternoon while kids were outside playing and they didn't care. They wanted people to be afraid of them. Hidden Valley homeboy, you can hear her. The escalation and violence with the Hidden Valley Kings and gangs around Charlotte in general were starting to catch the eye of the community. May 22nd, 2005. This security video at Rack Runner's Bar shows HVK's Jermaine Massey, J-Rock, taking shots at 25-year-old Samuel Brown. Brown died at the scene. It was a murder motivated by power. If I challenge this dude, that's gonna show my power. And it wasn't like no gang beef beef, but it was beef with a king. That's how it basically was. And he lost his life. J-Rock fled before the cops could arrest him. Massey was hanging low for a while. Nobody had seen him on the street. Nobody was talking about him. Um, we had ended up getting a tip that he was staying in a hotel. On June 10th, just three weeks after the shooting, police caught up with him. Hotel security video shows a SWAT team moving in for the arrest. SWAT members lined up in the hallway outside the door, at which time they took uh, Massey into custody. Once they had Massey secured, they did a search of the room. The cops found the gun from Samuel Brown's murder and a baggie of crack cocaine. Five months later, the Charlotte PD and the FBI formed a joint task force. We started looking at how we could put together a bigger case on them to actually have some kind of impact. The focus of this task force was going to be to disrupt and dismantle the Hidden Valley Kings. The Kings then staged their most public display of violence. That's how we do it. November 28, 2005. Eastland Shopping Mall, North Charlotte. HVK members and a 22-year-old drug dealer, Juan Lawrence, began to fight when he allegedly refused to pay taxes to the Kings. Juan Lawrence and the Hidden Valley Kings had a rivalry going back for a long time. The food court was the site as shots rang out. The gang members scattered before police could arrive. The battle didn't end there. That evening, HBK members lured Lawrence to a parking lot on North Tryon Street, right outside Hidden Valley. Juan Lawrence later that day went to go meet someone behind a business. He was cornered by members of the Kings and a gun battle ensued. Lawrence fled the parking lot in his car. The HBKs went after him. The cars careened up North Tryon Avenue while the Kings and Lawrence fired on one another. There was a rolling shootout going up North Tryon Street. They were literally driving down a main thoroughfare in Charlotte and shooting at a car. It was almost like the Wild West. Eventually the cars crashed. Juan Lawrence went on foot. The HBKs hunted Lawrence street by street. Some of the gang members actually ran through people's homes as the chase ensued. The Hidden Valley Kings came after him, and he was shot point blank with a high-powered assault rifle and killed. It was done brazenly, out in the open. The cold-blooded killing and ruthless battle shocked the hornet's nest. The public was outraged, and the task force had seen enough. It was time to take down the Hidden Valley Kings. The task force began by building a case against the gang, using evidence from some unlikely sources. 
6.27 p.m. September 25th, 2006. We developed informants, kind of had a game plan as to what we were going to do, who we were going to target. You start flipping gang members. In other words, you start getting them to cooperate. And they will talk about the other gang members. By covertly recording the crimes of gang members and their associates, informants hope to get lighter sentences or plea bargains. In doing so, they were risking their own lives. Here, one suspected gang member almost discovers that he is under surveillance. Uh -huh. What the hell is that box? Uh huh? The box. What? Yeah. Hanging out about to fall out your pants. Oh, okay. Yeah. Radio. Oh, MP3. Yeah. Snitches get stitches all day. They do get dealt with. So you got to filter out those people who, who really not built for this Look at the barn, look for some shake or something. You see some seeds. Yeah, you ain't got no seeds. Oh, you just cooked this up. This never-before-seen surveillance video documented drug deals, giving the cops their first clear glimpse of how the Hidden Valley Kings had been rolling all along. You got a little heat up for sale, man. Damn, man, I need some heat, cool. The most important surveillance target, HVK leader Roscoe Abel. This video shows an informant buying seven grams of crack cocaine from Abel. Money exchanges hands. It's actually counted out. Weight on a scale. You can see all of his tattoos. And, I mean, his face is plain as day. It's... No denying that it's him. So what's that, six? Six. Three. Six, three. So I owe you a point. I owe you a point. Here, Roscoe gives some advice to a fellow king. Now, I've been hustling 20 years. I ain't never had a dope car. Never. Now, I'm trying uh -huh. to show you from ex my experience so you can learn from my mistakes. Yeah. Because everybody can't learn from their mistakes. Some nope. mistakes cost you your life. And I was blessed to learn from mine to pass it on to the youngest so they won't make the same mistakes. For almost two years, the task force accumulated evidence, making multiple small buys over the course of months. We didn't buy large amounts of crack. We didn't go buy like ounces. We went and bought grams. And over time, the weight builds up. These guys telling on each other builds up. If you start buying drugs and you have money, you're gonna get in with someone. And we were able to buy drugs from all the different gang members. And one gang member would often be with another gang member, so you start making associations. Then, on March 30th, 2007, authorities made their move. More than 100 task force agents took down the Hidden Valley Kings. Those who weren't caught in the dragnet were shocked by what was happening. I'm watching the news. Boom. Hidden Valley, it had in the big letters HBK. The next thing you know, you see all of them getting out the van. They, they call them out. Boom. They're on their way to federal court facing 20 years to life. And I'm like, damn, doing 20 years? Damn, what the going on? The Hidden Valley Kings have ruled Charlotte's streets for almost a decade. At first, they kept their turf well defended, and the drug money flowed freely. Then, uncontrolled violence brought them unwanted attention from local law enforcement and the FBI. The Hidden Valley Kings had the potential to be some of the largest money makers in the city of Charlotte, and I think their violence got in the way of them making money. In March 2007, 20 members and associates of the HVKs, including their leader, Roscoe Abel, were indicted on multiple drug-related charges, including drug conspiracy and drug distribution. It was one of the biggest gang crackdowns in Charlotte's history. Prosecutors used information from snitches, including video and audio surveillance. It was an open and shut case. I'm ready to go over it. Yeah. 
20 members and associates of the HVKs pled guilty and received various sentences. Their leader, Roscoe Abel, was sentenced to 20 years in prison and 50 years of supervised release. There has to be a message there for the younger guys who want to step up and take their places that law enforcement's going to be looking at the activities of this gang. The crackdown has resulted in an almost immediate change in the valley. The residents of this community have been able to come out and actually enjoy their streets again. The officers have definitely noticed a decrease in crime. With having such an insular community, the impact on that community is doubled or tripled when you have such crime in there because it's so endemic to one place. So if you remove some of that criminal element, hopefully the burden on that community is lifted as well. But the HBKs still have power in their hood. I could see a change in the neighborhood, but it, it never stopped. Some former HVK members like Damian Hill, AKA D-Block, see a different message, that they're lucky to still be on the streets. Like Roscoe, I know this dude. I used to date his little sister. I just feel like that could have been me, like easily. That could have been me. I, like I said, I'm just blessed that I, that I was, I was aware and I was just conscious of the, of the things I was doing. The gang has also learned something about brotherhood. Your boys will ride with you, shoot with you, but they ain't finna do no time with you. <laughs> Hell no. Some former gang members decided to get out. After years of banging, D-Block began to question his loyalty to the gang after his daughter's birth. And it just changed my life. Like when I had my daughter, my first little girl, that was it. That was it right there. I said I couldn't see myself going through the same thing. Sharon Barnett's wake-up call came when his parents asked him to sign a life insurance policy they took out in his name. They said I wouldn't live to see 22, and I believed that I wouldn't at the rate that I was going. I had just smoked probably an eight ball of dope. I've been going and thugging for three months straight after I finished. It was a sickness on the inside of me. And something came to me today, I believe, to be the voice of God. And it said, it's over with. Sharon is now a self-described street soldier, working with an organization that helps gang members get off the streets. I never went back to the lifestyle, but I went back to my community because I know I was brought out only to bring somebody else out. Charlotte authorities are committed to keeping the peace after decades of ignoring that the city had a gang problem. I can tell you that there are many more hidden Vikings out there. Born and bred all day, being valid, you know what I'm saying? But also that we will attack the gangs wherever they are. And if they're continuing to commit criminal endeavors, we will be there. They're either gonna end up dead or in jail. They're gonna be separated from their families, their friends, their kids for a long time. The Hidden Valley Kings say the gang is here for the long haul. Just tell them that they believe it's dead. Come over here and, and chill with us for a little while. They might like it. They might want to join the family. We finna take this solid to a whole nother level. We finna take these Hidden Valley to a whole nother level. Because kings ain't dead. We still kings, you hear me? And we still out here. They ain't stopping it. I don't think the intentions was to, was to be as notorious and as vicious as it is, but what can you expect? We're living in a crazy world. And that's why I say every day is getting worse.